the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the final part of Donaldus Tramphius series in Hour of the Truth. It has been three parts and reflecting about what, over what we have seen in the first two parts, I think it is also very important that we understand who the Jesuits are. There are always new viewers to my videos and people who don't have the right understanding who Jesuits are. And that's why I want to bring to them also close the knowledge of who the Jesuits really are. Because what is taught today in the world what they are, that is not what they are. I can assure you that. Now... <sighs> It has been quite some time and quite a journey um, when God revealed himself to me. Of course, in the beginning I thought I was looking for God and I found God. But that's when I was ignorant of the Bible that says that man does not seek God. God has its chosen and he reveals himself to them. And he puts them sometimes on a journey. And on that journey you meet people. And then you travel along, because sometimes you keep with these people, because you are of the same mind, and sometimes you see that you are not of the same mind, and that's when your ways part. I have had one in the time brother in Christ who I uh, appreciated very much at the time I was quote-unquote awakening, I was quote-unquote on my way, on my search to God, or God was on his search to <laughs> reveal himself to me, let's say. I don't have any more contact with him because he is a futurist and he doesn't want to repent of his wrong teaching and his wrong belief and as long as that is that way, 
I will not have any contact with him anymore. But there is a video that he put out, and that is not to be found anymore, but um, another channel uh, mirrored that video, and I got it from there. And I want to show you that video today, in our recording here of Donaldus Tramfius, part 3, so that everybody can see what the Jesuits are all about. You know, we watched already this video about Georgetown University, we watched about John Carroll, who was 26 years educated by the Jesuits over here in Europe, in Brugge and St. Omer, and all these cities and became the first <clears throat> Roman Catholic bishop in the United States of America, the Bishop of Baltimore, and was the founder of Georgetown University. We saw all that. But still there are some things that are very important about the Society of Jesus, and that is what do they believe? Which Jesus do they worship? And therefore I want to refer to that video that I have prepared here, and that is from my former brother in Christ, um, Alan Lamont. So I'm going to show you that video. It is called The Vatican, Another Jesus, um, the Babylonian, the Jesuit Babylonian Sun God. And we're going to watch that video. It's about thir 13 and a half minutes. And let's have a look at it. And when there's something that needs to be addressed, I will stop the video and give a comment. But let's have a look now at this. Hi there, my name is Alan Lamont. I'm sharing a message right now on Jesus the Son God and I'm going to explain first of all from the crucifixion and as you can see there's a picture here of Jesus Christ crucified dying on a cross at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I'm going to really go in deep into this imagery here and this symbolism. Okay. Now the main point of this is that Jesus is on a cross as portrayed dying you know and uh, most Catholics would look at this and think well Jesus Christ is just you know dying for the sins of the world for the sins of mankind uh, there's nothing else that one could see from this except he's paying the price for the forgiveness of our sins and obviously you know after that he rose from the dead and he lives today and that's about all a Catholic mind will see Yet, you know, this image in the Catholic Church of the Holy Sepulchre at the Temple Mount of Jerusalem is actually portraying a dead Christ. And you see, the Babylonian Brotherhood, they always speak through signs and symbols. But they do not mean what you think they mean. They mean something else. And this cross is a satanic display of the defeat of the dead Jesus, or the dying Christ. It does not represent how the Lord Jesus overcame death, the devil and sin. In fact, it shows just the opposite. And it talks about in Matthew 27 how they passing by reviled him and saying, You destroy the temple and you build it in three days. Save yourself if you be the son of God. Come down from that cross. This is really satanic. You know, people don't realize, you know, the fact that Jesus is crucified on a cross. People don't see it. They don't see it. What is it that the Jesuits are revealing through the symbol of Christ crucified continuously? Especially this image. And I'm going to go deep into this, as I said. So, okay. This is really defiance of Christ. This is scorning Christ. This is crucifying Christ again. You know. This is keeping Jesus on a cross. You know. This is what it is. This is not about penance or forgiveness. This is not about the grace of God bringing salvation. So who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus that's on that cross at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Well, it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not him. And I want to explain that. Now, if you actually go and you look at this cross, it's the Roman Babylonian sun god of Nimrod that's who they're portraying also through this and I'll explain that now also the crosses that are used 
by the Roman Catholic Church, you know, display this dead Jesus, this dying Christ, okay? On top of the crucifix you will see the initials IHS, which is, you know, supposed to stand for Hog Signo. In this sign you will conquer. But the cross that Constantine allegedly witnessed was the Chirio, that's C H I R H O, Chirio. And it's obviously a Babylonian cross. Uh, sometimes also you see on the banner above the crucifix the words inscribed I N R I, also I H S, supposed to mean Nazar Rex Iadora which is spelled N-A-Z-A-R-E-R-E-X-I-U-D-E-O-R-U. -E -E so, what I just put in here is a text of the Oath of the Jesuits. I read in German, so that's German. But what you can read anyway is the Latin words that Alan speaks about, I-N-R-I, -I, the letters that are above almost all the crosses in the Roman Catholic Church. And I-N-R-I -I stands for Justum, Neca Regis Impious. And Alan will us tell in a moment what that stands for in English. It's just to kill impious and heretical kings and governments of this world. That's what INRI on the cross stands above. Iustrum Neca Regis Impious. But he's going to tell about that. This has got no reference to Jesus Christ whatsoever, and I'll explain this right now. The INRI is a Jesuit oath, which means in the Jesuit oath it is just to kill heretical kings or princes, it is just to kill them. So, what is it they're displaying the Jesuits here, first of all? They're explaining that it is just to kill Jesus Christ. For they see him as a heretical king. He does not have the sovereign right or authority to rule over this earth or the church. For they worship the Babylonian religion of Nimrod, also the IHS. It stands for, you know, Isis, Horus, and Seb. And uh, IHS does stand for, as I've said, I Isis, Horus, and Seb. This is the religion of the Jesuits, you know. Isis was the Egyptian great mother goddess. Isis was another name, really, for Samarimus. And... Uh, she was also known as the Immaculate Virgin and the Jesuits were known at the very foundation by Ignatius Loyola, the first father general, as Knights of the Virgin Mary. This was not Mary, they were Knights of Samaramus, Knights of Babylon. That's the true title of the Jesuits, Knights of Babylon. And so this IHS, you know, is just... Uh, you know, the symbol of the Jesuit order. So this Church of the Holy Sepulchre, also you will see on the floor, the symbol of the sun. This is also the symbol on the Jesuit seal, the sunburst. Can you see it there, on the bottom? This is the symbol of Nimrod's sun god religion, ultimately being Lucifer, the sun bearer. Okay? It was worshipped in Egypt through Set. That's why we have the name Sun Set. It's the god Set, which is Lucifer. But the Jesuits here, you will also see the next picture. Look, you see the sun boss literally around Christ. What's that proclaiming? That's proclaiming, first of all, I'll explain that in Babylon, Nimrod was eventually killed by his uncle because he was outraged by his wickedness. And his mother who was also his wife, called Queen Samaramus, the goddess queen of heaven. After the death of Nimrod, she had a son, and called him Tammuz. And obviously, in Egypt he was called Horus, but in Babel he was called Tammuz. And so what happened was, Nimrod, this is what Samaramus 
taught in the mysteries of Babylon is that Nimrod was reincarnated through her son as the sun god himself and became a god. So what they're proclaiming here is the coming forth of Nimrod. This is why in the eye above the triangle on the back of the American dollar you see the triangle, you know, and you see the eye at the top of the capstone. Yeah, so I'm gonna show you the picture of the American dollar for the people who do not know what it looks like. <laughs> this is what he is talking about. Yeah. The all-seeing eye of Lucifer, but obviously Horus. Horus is a type of the Antichrist, coming forth. This here is a temple of sun god worship. And Jesus Christ is right in the center, being crucified with the words that it's just to kill you, for you are heretical, and you will not reign over us. For we worship Satan, the light bearer, the illuminator. And we are of the Babylonian brotherhood, and this is a temple of the sun, and that's why they placed the crucifix there. If you also go to uh, what's known as the Church of the Nativity, you see the very same thing. The very same thing, where Jesus Christ is supposedly have been born. This is actually his birthplace. What do you see? You see the sun god symbol of Nimrod, right over the very exact place where he's supposed to be born. And here at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you see the sun symbol directly in front of Christ, exactly where he was put to death. As I've said, these Babylonian mystery schools, they speak through symbols and signs. And of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre attracts uh, tourists, you know, every year. You know, but... Uh, as I said in my previous message about uh, Constantine, you know, he worshipped the sun god Mithra, another name for Nimrod is Mithra. So this, they are Babylonian, <laughs> and they're revealing who they are for those that have eyes to see. Once again, look clearly at this picture. Look at the sun god pointing right, look at the sunburst. Look at that point, pointing rightly, directly at Jesus, being crucified. You know, this is satanic. It's Luciferian. And that's who these people are. Okay, that's what the Vatican is. Why do you think the Vatican brought all these crusades and inquisitions against the Protestants? Why? Why? It wasn't just that they were threatened or the power was threatened or the temporal power was threatened. It was the fact that they did not want to be exposed as Babylon the Great. The mystery Babylon. Okay, of the sun god worship of Nimrod and Lucifer. That's what they did not want to be exposed, okay? Because that's who they are. The Babylonian Brotherhood of Lucifer. And they actually do worship the sun, but they actually believe that when the sun rises, it's the light of illumination of Lucifer. And, uh, you know, this is uh, just Babylonian sun god worship. That's what it is, you know? And it's time for people to wake up and look at the Vatican, you know, as it really is. And, you know, this whole thing about Mary being the Queen of Heaven, you know, it has complete dominion over the Catholic Church. She is placed as the Queen of Heaven, you know. But we know that Mary is not the co-mediatrix. She is not seated at the right hand of God. She is not the, you know, one that we intercede to. That's not Mary. That's Samaramus that people are worshipping. When they see images of Mary, and they see the crown of Mary and the twelve stars, and they see the crescent moon under the feet, you know, this is Babylonian. This is the Queen of Heaven, the mother of Nimrod. That's what it is. And, uh, you know, in these last days, the Lord has given people revelation to expose the true nature of. Roman Catholicism. In fact, it's not just religion that's Babylonian. Uh, all of these uh, Vatican knighthoods, all of these high Vatican knights that rule our governments, subordinate to the Pope of Rome, of course, through high-level Freemasonry, they are part of this Babylonian conspiracy, you know. And the Roman Catholic Church, since the time of Constantine, has never been a Christian church. 
The book of Revelation says upon her forehead is the name written Mystery, Babylon the Great. Okay, I'm going to bring a conclusion. But this picture is a clear, clear revelation from the Jesuits for those that have eyes to see that above Jesus Christ at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre they have placed that statement that it is just to kill him it is just to put him to death and that's why they keep him there defeated that's why they keep him there you know dead on that cross with no power with no authority with no life yeah you know when you go into a Roman Catholic Church pay attention Jesus Christ is always depicted in two ways and two ways only the one, very often used, of course, together with Mary, which actually is the Queen of Heaven, and Semiramis, and not Mary, the biological mother of our Lord here on Earth, holding him as a baby, as a defenseless little baby in her arms, a baby or a little, little child. And the other way the Roman Catholic Church depicts Jesus Christ is as Alain Lamont describes here in this video, dead, helpless, hanging on a cross. That's the only way the Roman Catholic Church ever depicts Jesus Christ. Helpless, hanging on a cross, or helpless as a little baby. And that's why they honor the mother more than they honor the Creator, of course. Because they are pagans and they worship the dead. But let's Alain Lamont give this last minute. For the Vatican does not see Jesus Christ as the head of its church. They do not see Jesus Christ as their Lord and ruler. No. He will stay dead on that cross. He will stay defeated. The one that rules over the Vatican is the Sun God. It's Lucifer the bright and morning star, the sun of the morning. Okay? It's Lucifer, the light bearer, the giver of illumination. It's him that rules over the Vatican. It rules over world free masonry. It rules over all religions. It rules over everything. It's Babylon the Great. This is why the Jesuits put their sunburst there in display of the fact that they are worshippers of the Babylonian mysteries. Okay, my name is Alan Lamont, thanks for listening, and as always, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Alan. All roads lead to Rome, that's for sure. That's why I'm reading that book for the moment, All Roads Lead to Rome, as you probably know. And if you want to learn any l more about what we've just read, uh, about what we've just heard here from Alan Lamont, from his... Uh, speaking about the Babylonian roots of the Roman Catholic Church, then you can go to the playlist Babylon Mystery Religion, that is on my channel Juggler66, where I read that book from Ralph Woodrow, I think uh, 21 chapters if I'm not mistaken, in completion I read that. And um, you can look up the playlist and watch this chapter for chapter. You can download the book for free, the uh, download link of the book of Babylon Mystery Religion from Rav Woodrow is um, uh, provided in the description box of the video and you can have a look at themselves as you see they are between one hour and a few minutes and about 40 minutes each video as you can see and of course also I made an own video about uh, the weak retraction of the Babylon mystery religion of uh, Babylon mystery religion of that book that he wrote in 1966 he retracted that book in 1999 and I made a video about that so before you form yourself an opinion about this book watch the book reading first and then also watch this last video about a weak retraction of Babylon mystery religion and there you will see how the Roman Catholic Church is based in Babylon and that's all that video from Ella Lamont there just was all about that we were just watching. Now this is still called Donaldus Trumpheus, huh? the final thoughts, this video here. 
If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And if it walks like a Jesuit and talks like a Jesuit and preaches like a Jesuit, it is a Jesuit. And Donald Trump, Donaldus Trumpius, is a Jesuit coadjutor. At least we have seen already videos to prove this and we will see a little bit more in a moment. Because I have still prepared some things for us to watch today. But I thought this first video of Anne Lamont was interesting to lay the, um, the connection to the foundation. Uh, when we speak about that he's a Jesuit and when we speak about that he is actually good for Catholics, let, let me put it this way at this moment because I don't want to spoil the, the, coming, <laughs> the coming points. Uh, when he is good for the, Je for the, for the Jesuits and we, when he is uh, most and for all Uh, officially stating that he will be good for Catholics, now we have to understand that Catholics are not Christians in the sense that we Bible-believing, King James adhering Christians understand Christianity. And that every time when a man like Donaldus Trumpheus uses the word Christianity you can probably better insert the word Catholicism. Universal, universal Catholicism, because the word universal and Catholic means the same. It's one of the very first lessons everybody in the Roman Catholic Church learns in his catechism lesson. Catholic and universal are interchangeable words. And when Donaldus Trumpio speaks about Christianity, he means Catholicism. That's what he means, that's not what he says, but that's what he means. So when he says, I am a Christian, he means I am a Catholic. Because he has Jesuit training. He has had Jesuit training. And we're going to see that a little bit more in the next video. Now let's have a look, because I prepared this one to watch. Donald Trump, a puppet for the Jesuits of Rome. Let's have a look. Catholics are an important part of the American story. America has been strengthened by hardworking Catholics. From New York to California, the Catholic story is truly unique, and it's a great story. From marching for civil rights to educating millions of children, serving the poor, and helping to find the pro-life movement, clergy and lay Catholics across the country have made countless contributions to the American success and the American success story. Washington politicians have been hostile to the church. They have been hostile to Catholics. They have been hostile to the members of Catholicism. My administration will stand side by side with the American Catholics to promote the values we all share as Christians and Americans. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. We will make America great again. Okay, let's just take a little break here because you don't want me to analyze everything in this little minute that he just said and he spoke very open about Catholics now let me ask you one question without accusing Donald Trump Donaldus Trumpius of anything the United States of America was founded as a protestant nation out of 13 Protestant colonies, actually 12, one was Catholic, Maryland, but let's forget about that for a moment. In the time of 1776, 98% of the people who inhabited the land, what today is called the United States of America, were Protestant. Now there is a difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. The main difference is a Protestant is normally a Christian and a Catholic is as we just have seen is not but is a Romish Babylonian okay so we have to understand what Donald Trump was actually saying here when he said that he of that the Americans have so much to owe to the Roman Catholic Church I think we have to really think about this. Why does a protestant country formed out of millions of people who fled the suppression and the persecution of the biblical, prophetic and historical antichrist in Europe 
to fill that new world, to fill that beast out of the earth that is unhabited? Why did all the Protestants flee the Roman Catholic Church and now all of a sudden your president says we owe a lot to the Roman Catholic Church? Does that make any sense? Is the person that is persecuted to be grateful and thankful to the people who persecute them? Well, of course, when you, when you see it through the eyes of Jesus Christ, who said, pray for them that persecute you, be good to them that hate you, and be good to them that persecute you, okay. But that does not mean that I owe them anything. I don't owe the Roman Catholic Church anything when I am living in a Protestant country, and all of a sudden this Roman Catholic Church is taking away all my rights that my forefathers fought for. Okay, but let's go on here. And you can you can listen to it again. This last minute of uh, this first minute here of Donald Trump, listen to it again. What he says about Catholics, and we will see that a little bit later on again. Not the devil's horn, by the way. This last picture of Pope Francis, that was not the so-called devil's horn. That was the sign in, uh, in, uh, in, in the language, in signing language for the people who are uh, deaf and dumb, uh, for I love you. And the difference is the thumb that is going to the side also. That is the difference with the horn sign. But a lot of people do not know that, but I researched that, so... That doesn't mean, of course, that Pope Francis is not doing the horn sign, but he is not doing it in the picture that we just saw. Now, um, we're going to have a little reading of a little thing that I prepared. And um, therefore, we go to this video. What we've just seen here, I want to tell you also about this video that Trump and Clinton are actually 19th cousins. You know, there's a video out from um, Walter Feit, who I absolutely do not endorse, but the historical videos that he produced for even the Seventh-day Adventist churches are sometimes really good historical research, and for that I leave him. But the biblical doctrine, that's something else, that is satanic of the SDA, and it took me quite some time to learn that, so... Don't throw my what I say here overboard, <clears throat> but um, do your own research, and I can help you with that if you want to. Anyway, he did a video about those beamable, sustainable princes. 
where he showed that every American president up to Obama has link, blood links, is blood related to um, the, the German or the English uh, nobility, to the kings and queens of Germany and England. And also Trump and Clinton are actually 19th cousins and they are of the nobility bloodline. And it has been verified. Interestingly, the two of them are each related to royalty, as I just said. Yeah. So therefore, look that up from Walter Feit, the beamable and sustainable princess. Jesuits are the prince electors of the Dark Ages and beyond. They are the king makers. makers. Yeah, you can say, but the Pope makes the kings. That's right. But the Pope depends on the Black Pope. The White Pope is depending on the Black Pope because the Black Pope puts him in power or puts him to death. Yeah? And that's why the Jesuits are the king makers. In the centuries in the past, the confessional fathers of the kings were Jesuits. And through the confessional, they controlled the rulers of Europe. The priesthood owns everything, and all roads lead to Rome. Well, therefore, again, go to that playlist and watch that whole playlist or read that book for yourself, Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow, or you can also read Alexander Hislop's um, The Two Babylons, and of course you can read Romanism and the Reformation. All roads lead to Rome. Trump is a bridge builder for Caesar, which is actually Pope Francis, and a Catholic who is not a Christian. Now, I say that Pope Francis is Caesar, because we can read here, and this is Pope Francis when he enters into the Congress in 2015 in the United States of America, and beneath this, I put a quote from Pope Pius IX, Pio IX, the longest uh, pope in the pontificate, the longest reigning pope in the, in the, in the history of the popes, uh, from the 19th century until 1870 or 1871, he was reigning, more than 30 years. Pope Pius IX, in his discourse, that, where he said, quote, The Caesar who now addresses you, and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due. Those are the words of Pope Pius, a Pope who calls himself Caesar, the bridge builder, the Pontifex Maximus, and Trump is a bridge builder for this Caesar, building the bridge between the two continents, getting Beast 1 and Beast 2 together. Trump Donaldus Tramfius, as we like to call him in this little series, is subservient to the Jesuits and has brought about the dehumanizing of legitimate born-again Bible-believing Christians through propaganda. Any time, this is what I told you already before, any time he uses the word Christian, people should think to replace that word with Catholic, because he is interchangeably using these words in a clever game of magic. How can we all understand this? Well, when we go to the King James Bible and we read in Psalm 2, verses 1 through 5, we read, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Unquote. And Proverbs 11.30 I also find very fitting, where we read, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Yeah, he that winneth souls is wise, and that's what this ministry is for, 
to wake people up to the deception that their souls can be saved by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But therefore they need to be woken up. Maybe it's this video, maybe it's these words, maybe it's a video from Tom Fress, an Inquisition update, maybe it's something else. Whatever it may be, I'm doing all I can to try to win souls for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another video that I want to share with you, and that is called Donald Trump, Rome's Perfect Man. That's a video from uh, where Bill Hughes presents something, and we're going to watch that not in its completion, but we're going to watch that from about um, 41 minutes on. So let's have a look here, and there will come some explanation also. So this is the one, and we're going to watch that from 41 minutes on. So I'm just going to go to that uh, to that part. 41 minutes 08, I said. So we're going to start here, and then you can have a look at this video. Donald Trump, Donaldus Trumpius, Rome's perfect man. I will put the description box and the sorry. <laughs> I will put the link to the complete video in the description box of the video, and then you can watch it for yourself and complete. But I don't want to put this in completion into this video. That's not necessary. But we're gonna watch about five minutes right now. Enjoy. Stones are coming out. That was left aside by the by the denomination. The Bible says that Rome controls Trump. Excuse me, that should be a capital T. As it does Clinton and most politicians. That's what the Bible says. The CFR controlled by the Jesuits controls both political parties in America. Trump has been educated and has had one of his sons educated by the Jesuits. These are facts. He has promised to do their bidding. I'll read you the quote. He is Rome's perfect man. Donald Trump, according to the Washington Post, July 17 of 2015, Trump attended Fordham University for the first two years of his college. Fordham University is one of the top three Jesuit schools in America. You've got Georgetown, you've got Xavier, and you've got Fordham. Then he transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. But folks, Donald Trump is very familiar with the Jesuit order. He was trained there at Fordham University. Donald Trump has declared that if elected president, his foreign policy advisor will be Richard Haas. So now we're going to take a little break from what uh, Bill Hughes is telling us here. And we have a look at the Wikipedia page of Richard Haas, who will be the foreign policy advisor of Donald Trump. At that time, he spoke in the future tense because this video is made before the election of Donald Trump, as you probably understood. Okay. Richard Nathan Haas is an American diplomat. He has been president of the Council on Foreign Relations since July 2003. So as he... Uh, as um, he says here, um, does he say that here about 14 years? Yeah. yeah, he has been president of the CFR for the last 14 years. So that's correct, 2003 through 2017. And the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, is not only run by Jesuits and of course their papal knight orders like the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus, but it is founded by the Jesuits. And you can even see that when you go to their website of the CFR and you see their Pegasus, their, horses with, their horse with wings. That is one of the emblems the Jesuits use. Okay. Prior to which, meaning the president of foreign relations, Richard Haas, was director of policy planning for the United States Department of State and a close advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell one of the neocons at that time. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I think it is very interesting that we understand 
that from 1989 to 1993 was a special assistant to United States President George H. W. Bush and National Security Council Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs. In 1991, Haas received the Presidential Citizens Medal for helping to develop and explain U.S. policy during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Previously, he served in various posts in the Department of State and the Department of Defense. So you see what kind of person Donald Trump is uh, choosing to be his advisor in foreign policy and here we see him I'm gonna give you the description here just have to scroll a little bit you see Senator Jim Webb Council on Foreign Relations President Richard N. Haas former Deputy Secretary of State Gen uh, John Negroponte former Senator John Warner and journalist Andrea Mitchell and Ronald uh, at Ronald Reagan Centennial Roundtable 2011 here this is this round that we are seeing here so you see what kind of people Donald Trump is choosing for his administration a person who has been 14 years the chairman of the Jesuit-founded Council on Foreign Relations. So, what does that tell you? Council on Foreign Relations, Jesuit run, Roman Catholic run, and Donaldo Strampfio said in the beginning of our very first video that he is a Presbyterian, that he is a Protestant. Okay. Haas also wrote, wrote a book, The Reluctant Sheriff, and that is quite interesting to read. I'm not going to read it all for you, but he says that actually the United States of America should play the role of sheriff of the world, the international police force. And that's what they are doing. The America, the United States of America is playing not only the international police force and the international military force, the United States of America is the second beast of Revelation 13 that will bring into fruition the complete healing of the wound of Revelation 13's afflicted first beast, the Vatican. Because the people have been duped into believing that the Pope is a single individual person that will come seven years before Jesus Christ returns, and they don't accept and understand anymore that the Antichrist is the papacy, the papacy says, now you have to restore everything that you took away from me through the Reformation, through Protestantism, because you now say, I am not the Antichrist. So when the Pope is not the Antichrist, he has to be restored in all glory that he had during the Dark Ages. And that's what the New World Order is. A returning to the Old World Order. It's that simple. And this Haas here says in this article, that he opts for imperial America being an imperial foreign policy, uh, making an imperial foreign policy, and uh, the US role would resemble the 19th century Great Britain, and so on and so on, and the United States of America is to play the role of international sheriff. And not only international sheriff, but, and that's the point, making every nation that goes against the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church, that goes against the belief system of Catholicism, to force so-called, um, how, how do they say that, um, regime changes. Yeah? There is no regime change in this world without the interference of the United States of America, military and, econo and, uh, and economy. Of course there's not. And that is needed to restore the Pope to the situation that he had at the moment before the Reformation took it away. And the Reformation took his glory away because they uncovered, they exposed the biblical truth that the papacy is the Antichrist. And everybody who was a Protestant at that time, and even should be today, who calls himself a Protestant, should believe and should scream it from the rooftops that the papacy is the Antichrist. But because of the ecumenical movement, 
Now it is not anymore. And we saw that in one of the videos before, you know, when Ronald Reagan was in, uh, inaugurated into his office, that was done he facing the obelisk, that was a secret sign for the Jesuits worldwide, that now, through the ecumenical movement, America had been taken over and is now Roman Catholic. Watch the other parts if this is the first part you watch. You will really learn a lot about that. And you can only understand the role of the United States military and the role of the United States police force when you have any idea what uh, this uh, Richard Haas means by playing the role of international sheriff. But let's continue with uh, Bill Hughes for a moment. Well, who is Richard Haas? Sometimes you can tell what a person is by the people that are around him. Well, Trump said he's going to have Richard Hawes as his foreign policy advisor. You know who Richard Hawes is? President of the CFR for the last 14 years. This man is a tool of the Jesuits and Trump wants him right there next to him telling him how to handle the guy in North Korea. Not too smart. <laughs> Clearly, if Trump were president, certain appointed CFR members would be directing his actions and making his policies. The Jesuits are running the White House. You say, but wait a minute, Bill. I, I'm, I'm kind of for some of the things Trump is saying. And I'll be very blunt and honest with you. To have a wall that says the only people that come into America are those that come legally. I like that idea. If somebody wants to come to America, great, just do it legally. Don't, don't shoot your way across the border and then have a child just inside Texas or Arizona and say this is a U.S. citizen, therefore we can stay. And another point that has to be made here, Bill Hughes is using the sophistic or casuistic term illegal immigrants the people who come from south and middle america mostly mexico and they come all via the mexican border to the united states of america they are not illegal immigrants when you are a protestant there is no other way to see them as foreign enemy invaders because they are all Roman Catholics invading a quote-unquote Protestant country. When a Protestant country is over flooded with people who have a diabolical, a Babylonian, satanical, Roman Catholic belief system that is 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches in a Bible-believing Protestant country, then these people cannot be given another name but enemy invaders. They are invaders. They are an army. Okay, they don't all wear weapons and shoot at you right away, but they will fight with their spiritual weapons as we should too. That's not right. Even Pope Francis who says, oh, that's not loving if you build a wall. Do you know how, how high the wall is that surrounds Vatican City, folks? Do you know? They don't let anybody there illegally. And neither should we. Neither should we. But the Jesuits are running the White House today. Not to be outdone, Donald Trump sent his son Eric to Georgetown University, graduating from its McDonough School of Business in 2006. Obviously, folk, Donald Trump has a, a great respect, admiration, sends his children to Georgetown. That says something. Trump's Supreme Court appointee is Judge Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch went to Georgetown Preparatory School. It's an American Jesuit college preparatory school for boys grades 9 through 12. 
It's the most, the, among the most Ill, selective prep schools. The only Jesuit boarding school in the country. It's located in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Washington on 90 acres in North Bethesda, Montgomery County, Maryland, outside the District of Columbia. Now, this is what Donald Trump said. It's right here in Charisma. Yeah, and here we're going to stop this video because that's something I'm going to tell you in another way. <laughs> uh, I still have something to do in this video, Donaldus Trumpius, last part, and we are probably being a little bit about more an hour, but I don't care. I'm going to bring this to an end right now, and I'm going to read to you something that I have prepared already, of course, and that is the letter that um, uh, Bill Hughes just wanted to address. Um, that is a letter Donald Trump wrote to Catholic leaders. This letter is dated 10th of October 2016, so almost a year ago, because today is the 1st of August. But that's no point. The point is that letter was written by Donald Trump before he was elected. And it's going to be something very interesting that we read in here. So please pay attention for the closing remarks of Hour of the Truth, Donaldus Trumpius series. Donald Trump, unable to attend a Catholic leadership conference, penned a letter to the group. Last week, both major party presidential nominees were invited to speak at the 18th annual Catholic leadership conference held in Denver, Colorado. Donald Trump told the group he had a scheduling conflict, while Hillary Clinton waiting until two days before the event to let organizers know she wouldn't be there. Unable to attend, but wanting to address the group, Trump penned the following letter. And I'm going to tell you one thing before I even read this letter. Hillary Clinton was waiting two days before she let the organizers know she wouldn't be there. That is kind of an offense for Roman Catholics. Donald Trump let them know that he had a scheduling conflict, but he, unable to attend, wanting to address the group of Catholic leadership conferences in Denver, Colorado, addressed them by a letter that we read right here. That is the reason why he probably was preferred by the Roman Catholics over Hillary Clinton. Dear friends, Unfortunately, my schedule precludes me from meeting and talking with you at the Catholic Leadership Conference today in Denver. First, I would like to send my warm greetings to the Denver Archbishop Samuel Aquila. In discussions with my Catholic advisory group, it is clear Archbishop Aquila's leadership in the Denver Archdiocese has been exemplary as was the leadership of his predecessor, Archbishop Charles Shepard. Second, should I be elected president, I look forward to working with these two respected leaders of the Catholic Church in America, their brother bishops and Congress on issues of critical importance to the Catholic Church and Catholics. Catholics in the United States of America are a rich part of our nation's history. And I have to interrupt here. Yeah? Catholics in the United States of America are a rich part of our nation's history, of the history of getting away from them, throwing them out, and during the colonial time, forbidding Roman Catholics to hold any office or to hold the sacrament of the Mass. Why couldn't a Roman Catholic hold any political office in that time? Because a Roman Catholic swears his first allegiance not to the country that he is serving, but to the Pope in Rome. Catholics in the United States of America are a rich part of our nation's history. They rose from less than 1% during the colonial times to more than 30% today in 2017. Thanks to among others, the black general, uh, the black pope, uh, general of the Society of Jesus, Bex and Rotan, these two from the 19th century. I spoke about them in other occasions. They were responsible for flooding the United States in the 19th century with Roman Catholics.
But let's continue the letter. The United States was and is strengthened through Catholic men, women, priests and religious sisters ministering to people, marching in the civil rights movement, educating millions of children in Catholic schools, creating respected health care institutions and in their founding and helping the ongoing growth of the pro-life cause. I don't even want to get started with commenting on what I've just read here. You can make your own thoughts about this. But when he says the United States was and is strengthened through Catholic men, women and priests, how can a protestant country that is the opposite of Roman Catholicism be strengthened by Roman Catholic men, women, priests and religious sisters? Now, comes the very important sentence I want to share with you. I, Donaldus Tramfius, have a message for the Catholics in the United States of America. I will be there for you. I will stand with you. I will fight for you. That's what Donald Trump says in this official letter that you can still get on the internet. The link will be provided in the description box so you can read it for yourself online. Donaldus Trump says, I have a message for Catholics. Point, 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 point. I will fight for you. Now let me ask you one little question. When the President of the United States is fighting for something, probably with military means, is he fighting or is he sending his soldiers? Okay, when you answer that he is sending his soldiers, you are correct. So when Donald Trump, Donaldus Tramfios, will fight for the Catholic cause, through his military, that means that the military of the United States of America is being misused, is being abused as a Roman Catholic crusading military all over the world. Professing Christ, but spreading Antichrist. This sentence is of such a great importance, I cannot repeat it often enough. Let it sink in, read it for yourself, think about it and then spread this message what it actually means. Donaldus Tramfio says, I have a message for Catholics, I will be there for you, I will stand with you, I will fight for you and when the president fights, his soldiers fight. And that's your family. That's your father, that's your mother, that's your brother, that's your sister, that's your son, that's your daughter. That's your uncle, that's your nephew, that's your aunt. That's your neighbor, that's your friend. America has a lot of soldiers who are blind because they are patriotic for the United States of America. And they don't understand that Donaldus Trumpius and the other presidents before, of course, also are abusing them for the goals of the Roman Catholic Church, for the agenda of the Antichrist and not for Jesus Christ. You may be living in a protestant country, but you are fighting a Roman Catholic crusade all over the world. And this is what Donald Trump here promises. He promises this to the Catholic Leadership Conference in Denver, Colorado. Continuing in the letter. As First Lady, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State and two-time presidential candidate, <clears throat> Hillary Clinton has been hostile to the core issues and policies of greatest concern to Catholics. Life, religious liberty, Supreme Court nominations, affordable and quality health care, educational choice and homeschooling. For instance, Hillary Clinton supports forcing the little sisters of the poor who have taken care of the elderly poor since 1839. 
pay for contraceptives in their health care plan, even though they have never wanted them, never used them, and never will use them, and having the government fine them heavily if they continue to refuse to abide by this onerous mandate. That is a hostility to religious liberty you will never see in a Trump administration. That is a hostility to religious liberty you will never see in a Trump administration. Now let me or let us define the words religious liberty. You know religious liberty is one of the key points of the United States Constitution in the Bill of Rights in the First Amendment. Right? Or it's the second amendment or the third, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an American, forgive me, but I know that it states that Congress shall make no law concerning any religion. Okay? So, what is religious liberty? Religious liberty is for Roman Catholics the liberty to practice Roman Catholicism. And for them to practice Roman Catholicism, that means that Protestants cannot worship their God as God institutes in the Bible. Those are two contradictive agendas. And who, you think, will have the power in the end? This is a hostility to religious liberty you will never see in the Trump administration. So in the Trump administration you will not see hostility against religious liberty, meaning a Trump administration will stand for Catholics, will be there for Catholics and will fight for Catholics, for the Catholics' right to practice their idolatrous and superstitious religion in a Protestant country. Continuing in the letter. Hillary Clinton's hostility to the issues of greatest importance to Catholics is made worse by her running mate, Senator Tim Kaine. Once pro-life and against partial birth abortion, Kaine now has a 100% voting record from the National Abortion Rights Action League. Kane once was for traditional marriage, even saying, quote, it is a uniquely valuable institution that must be preserved, unquote. But as of 2013, Kane no longer supported traditional marriage. And on religious liberty? Shockingly, even Kane supports forcing the little sisters of the poor to pay for contraceptives in their health care plan to have the government fine them heavily if they refuse. This with the little sisters of the poor, whatever is mentioned here, has nothing to do with religious liberty. On issues and policies of greatest concern to Catholics, the differences between myself, Donaldo Stramfios, and Hillary Clinton are stark. I will stand with Catholics and fight for you. Hillary Clinton has been openly hostile to these core Catholic issues for a long time and is only going to be worse with Tim Kaine now following her lead. On life, I am and will remain pro-life. I will defend your Roman Catholic religious liberties, not the religious liberties of Protestants, I will defend your Roman Catholic religious liberties and the right to fully and freely practice your religion as individuals, as business owners and academic institutions. I will make absolutely certain religious orders like the Little Sisters of Poor are not bullied by the federal government because of their religious beliefs. I will protect and work to expand educational choice, the rights of homeschooling families and end common core. I will repeal and replace Obamacare so you can have better and more affordable health care. I will keep our country and community safe while respecting the dignity of each human being. I will help Catholic families and workers and all families and workers by bringing jobs back to our country where they belong. And I will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will strictly interpret the Constitution and not legislate from the bench, 
like Justice Clarence Thomas in the la uh, and the late and beloved great Catholic thinker and jurist Justice Antonin Scalia, who was probably murdered a few months ago, last year, somewhere. And we have read, uh, we have uh, just learned in the video from Bill Hughes that the justice in the Supreme Court replacing Antonio Scalia will be, what's his name, Neil Gorsuch. Yeah? Neil Gorsuch. And uh, you can look him up on Wikipedia to understand what he lives for. But just giving you this little clue. Gorsuch is the son of David Gorsuch and Anne Gorsuch Burford, who was born Anne Irene McGill and deceased in 2004. She was a Colorado State House representative who was later appointed by President Ronald Reagan to be the very first female administrator of United States Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency in 1981, the EPA. Yeah? Gorsuch attended Harvard, Harvard Law School, and so on, and so on, and he is Jesuit educated, no, no, no problem about that. He is a Roman Catholic through the core, and then Donald Trump says in this letter, I will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will strictly interpret the Constitution and not legislate from the bench. Uh, but interpret the Constitution. When you give a Roman Catholic the power to interpret the Constitution of the United States of America, which is a protestant paper, according to George W. Bush, a GD piece of paper, what do you think? What kind of interpretation are you going to get? Huh? We are at the crossroads in our country, Donaldus Trumpius continues. Much like 1980, the time before Ronald Reagan came to power. But the stakes are higher now, the highest they have ever been. We have two candidates representing entirely different agendas for our country that will take it in two completely different directions for generations to come. <laughs> we have two candidates representing entirely different agendas. Yes, but that's for the outside. On the inside, they are laughing about you. Yeah? Why? Because both agendas are held by the Roman Catholic Church. So, they are laughing at you. I have a video made with that title. Here's the picture. They are laughing at you at the L. Smith dinner, which we saw already in one of the earlier parts of uh, Hour of the Truth, Donaldus Tramfius. Yeah? Hillary Clinton, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, if I'm not mistaken, and Donald Trump. And he is the successor of what was in the 1960s of last year, uh, of, of, of last millennium, Cardinal Spellman, the Archbishop of New York, the most powerful Roman Catholic in the United States of America. Hillary Clinton on his right and Donald Trump on his left are puppets on the strings of the Archbishop of New York. And here he says, we have two candidates representing entirely different agendas. Yeah, one is on the right, one is on the left. But the pendulum of the grandfather clocks goes from the right to the left and from the left to the right. And the only thing that changes is the hand on the clock, the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church, the agenda of the Antichrist, and nothing else. Thank you for giving me the time to share my thoughts with you on some of the critical issues facing us today. And I, Jörg, from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth, can absolutely end with the same words. But of course, mine come from the heart and without any mental reservation, and I mean them. So, I will end here the video series Hour of the Truth, Donaldus Tramfios, with these final thoughts that we just had. If it walks like a Jesuit 
and talks like a Jesuit and quacks like a Jesuit, it is a Jesuit. Thanks for watching. Thanks for commenting. God bless you. I see you next time. Bye bye. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say, The Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thou thine eyes upon thy truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, and I will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God, but these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them, a leopard shall watch over their cities, every one that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgression are many, and their backslidings are increased. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me, and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they had committed adultery, and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were as fed horses in the morning, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go ye up upon their walls, and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away their battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, says the Lord. They have believed the Lord, and said, It is not he. Neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, Because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is as an open sepulchre, and they are all mighty men. And they shall eat up thine harvest, and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thine herds, they shall eat up thine vines and thy fig trees, they shall impoverish thy fenced cities, wherein thou trustest. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. It shall come to pass, when ye shall say, Wherefore doeth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then shalt thou answer them, like as ye have forsaken me, and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in the land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob, and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail, though they roar, yet can they not pass over it? But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth us to the appointed weeks of the harvest. 
Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withheld good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait, as he has set his snares. They set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and wax rich. They are waxen fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof?